Hello, this is Judy Sarden, and I am here with Jennifer Hen. She is a homeschooling mom for, she was a homeschooling mom for 19 years. She has three grown children, and she's the author of Take the Mystery Out of Homeschooling, a How-To Guide. She is also working on um, Take the Mystery Out of Homeschooling, Your Child with Dyslexia. And I thought that it would be amazing to talk to Jennifer today because she discovered later in life that she herself has dyslexia and she was still able to manage, cope, be successful in life and also homeschool her own three children. And I thought it was an amazing story and would give a lot of hope to people out there who themselves may have um, learning disabilities and who may be concerned about not being able to homeschool their own children and also to give hope to people whose children do have dyslexia and other learning disabilities that there there is hope so without further ado let's have Jennifer tell us about herself hi Judy thanks for having me on hi everybody else um, so yeah I was actually a very typical student with learning undiagnosed learning disabilities you are um, well, let's just give her another year maybe next year will be her year oh she's not applying herself talks too much lazy, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I remember standing in the classroom in first grade when everybody had to stand up and we had to recite things and just moving my mouth because even though nobody said you're behind, I knew I was behind and I knew that I wasn't supposed to be behind for whatever reason. You just knew you didn't get it, but even a young child of six years old knows that they should be getting what the others are getting. So you, the discouragement can start young. Mm -hmm. And as far as my parents didn't understand, these things weren't talked about then. You can see videos on Amazon and in other places, many, many people that have stories like mine where the school system just didn't know how to handle us. So they passed me through. And then in seventh grade, because where I went elementary was first through sixth, and then I arrived in seventh grade to fail language arts and math. And I'm sure the teachers were thinking, what are you doing sending us this kid? She's not ready. And um, honestly, a lot of kids who have learning struggles like that do end up in trouble. Mm -hmm. I started skipping class in seventh grade. A friend said, hey, if you don't like it, just skip it. And I skipped the classes I didn't like. I didn't skip all day. And you would think, well, why didn't they ever look for me, turn me in? But my guess was because I was so behind and disruptive in class and not every child who's struggling with learning, but probably the opposite. Either they're just quiet in the corner, wishing they weren't there, or they're more stubborn and troublemaker like me. And so I just skip class and nobody ever turned me in. Nobody ever questioned me. I'm guessing the teacher thought, Phew not here. <laughs> and what else was I to do? By the time you get to seventh grade, you feel so hopeless. But it's also those really hard time of the years where you just have a lot of stupid going on and you know, sure. you know the hormones and the pure trying to be cool and be in. I mean, it's just off the charts at that preteen age. So my saving grace was literally, I lived in a small town and some of your listeners might be the same. They might think there's not access to something. But at the time, we found out that there was a one-room schoolhouse affiliated with this really strict church that was schooling kids, a private school. And I went there for a year and a half. I got there. They assessed me. They gave me work way above my level, even though they assessed me. No one there was able to help me. And so I did what kids across the country do when their parents like, okay, well, let's send them to private school. I cheated because your family, you know, your family's putting out extra resources, the time to drive you to school, paying for tutors or paying for private school. And now that's supposed to be the answer that you get it, but you don't. So I didn't want to cheat. I was really stuck. Nobody was helping me. You're supposed to advance every year. So I did. And then after a year and a half, I went back to public school and the counselor worked with me, high school counselor now, 
and I'm, you know, I have had a little bit older. I realized that being the teacher's enemy and getting in trouble was not a good way to go about it. And he did some creative work with the credits to, I was able to skip some science that would have had a lot of math. I wouldn't have been able to keep up with heavy reading. Mm -hmm. I learned how to get along with teachers. And I think in that, in that day, in the small town, there was a lot of oh, well, it doesn't matter. She's just going to get married and have kids and she's never <laughs> yeah. going to have a job and she's not going to go to college and it doesn't matter. And I look back and I think I had no plan for my life. Mm-hmm. No adult talked to me about what my plan was going to be. I thought, what in the world was I thinking? I was just going to graduate and then what? But I felt like such a fail- failure that I didn't even want to talk about it because by the oh. time I spent 13 years in school, um, I really did did believe I was dumb. Mm -hmm. One of the things that was good while I was in school is I have a singing voice. (laughs) I could sing first soprano and we had this new teacher that came to town in high school and he started a show choir. So I was in choir and show choir. So that gave me a group and it gave me something to do. And I always loved to write and tell stories, but in composition, I couldn't spell. Mm -hmm. and so and there were also spelling tests and I tried at first the teacher never did understand the spelling tests were so I was I'm guessing at this time that in high school that I was spelling at a third or fourth grade level Mm -hmm. and I was supposed to be writing these compositions but he gave spelling tests and he graded the spelling tests but he would not grade your spelling on your compositions And it was the only way that I was able to pass. And he loved my stories, but he'd say, won't you just try to spell? Won't you just try? Here I was a senior. Won't you just try? And I never, by then, I didn't have a voice myself to say, it's, I never said it's beyond me. Cause I did try the first few weeks. I went home and I studied and I wanted to please the teacher but there was no way I needed remediation. So it gave me A's on all my compositions and F's on all my spelling. And I graduated with the C, but for the most part, they were just going to like, you move on. And then I had to go through, well, not, I had to go through, I got to discover in the real world and I had been successful at other things, I guess I just didn't figure they were as important because Mm -hmm. everything in school Mm -hmm. is based around your grades. And of course, my older sibling, that's straight A's, valedictorian, took all the hard classes, um, got actually in our little town, got the largest scholarship ever awarded for college. Wow. (laughs) So you talk about polar opposites going on that two kids from one family can be so different, but parents know that we yeah. sometimes too, if we're in homeschool co-ops um, or church or scouts, we'll have one student from a family that might be difficult. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes the leaders like, Oh, that family or, Oh, those parents. I remember being told <laughs> once we needed to work on our parenting when we picked up a child from one age group and then we went to the next age group and we were told how what wonderful parents we were. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> So uh, we are given a variety of kids and there's nothing more humbling than our kids, right? Our kids will humble us. So if you have those, you know, that child that's getting straight A's and schoolwork just comes so easy. And I think as homeschool moms, even though we were in public school, my brother and I, you know, he was easy. Parents didn't ever have to worry about whether he was getting his schoolwork done, whether he knew where his papers were. I, I remember him and feeling sorry for him getting in trouble for getting a B, mm. thinking that wasn't fair. But he, you know, if he applied himself, he would get A plus and extra credit on everything. And then where where was I in this? So what were my eyes thinking? My eyes were thinking that I was trouble mm. and that I was not smart. So emotional intelligence or other giftedness that I had Again, a lot of it back then was, well, you're just going to be a mom and Mm -hmm. you can take care of kids really well. So that's that. But that is not what ended up happening. As I started working, I started to say, you know, I think maybe I'm not dumb Mm -hmm. because 
every time I get a job or want to learn something new, I learn it and it doesn't seem to be that hard. But the difference was it kind of was flipped in the real world. You learn and by doing. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. So this is kind of a crazy thing. I had actually had guardians in high school for part of my high school and had not been living with my parents. So when I graduated, I moved in with my parents. I all the way across the country, they were living in Texas. I had been in Idaho. And so we moved in and my dad said, okay, you need to go to school now. And I was like, whoa, college, junior college, he said. Okay, so even junior college, I was scared to death. I knew sure. I'd done nothing to prepare. I barely made it through high school. And he said, yes, you have to go to either junior college or cosmetology school. Well, I didn't want to do either, but when dad says you have to, and again, I didn't really speak up because I remember thinking, how in the world would I go to junior college when there was never, ever a plan, mm -hmm. you know, nobody to help me looking back Oh my word. I wish I would have had help. I, I wish I would have. Of course. But then again, I do have a story because I didn't. So I went to cosmetology school and I also worked. So cosmetology school was 40 hours a week and I worked 30 to 35 hours a week. Oof. Yes. So I rarely had a day off. And so a lot of times I arrived at school late where the textbook time was. Mm. So you had, you're supposed to study the textbook work for about two months and then you were done. And then you just did your floor work. It took about a year if you went full time. And usually I slept in and didn't go to class. <laughs> I think I went to class twice the whole time I was there. But man, could I do hair? And I remember one time getting upset. I said, how come all these girls are sitting around, but you just give me customer after customer after customer. And she said, it's because they asked for you. I said, oh, so I finished my hours. Now it's time to go to take a state exam. You've got to travel to the capital of Texas and take this cosmetology test. So I thought I would open my book. Wow. So I opened my book because there's two parts to the test. There's the written test mm -hmm. and then there's the practical. Mm -hmm. And I studied for about two weeks, but what happened when I opened that book is it all made sense because I'd been doing it. Uh, I uh -huh. flipped it uh -huh. without realizing I flipped it. Uh -huh. So I had been hands on, hands on for months. I opened up the textbook, learned some of the terms, memorized some of the things I needed to memorize, went to the state, and the first part of the test was practical. I was the first one done in the room. In fact, it was supposed to be an all day test. It wasn't even lunch and I was done. They said, okay, you're done. So just go over here and wait. We're going to give you the written test after lunch. Mm -hmm. So then I took the written test and um, I passed with a 90. Oh, wow. Everything. So, so were you shocked? I was. I was shocked. And in fact, even when I was the first one done in the room with the practical part, mm -hmm. I thought I had missed something and I was scared and thought I'd messed it all up because you had to do a certain number of things in a particular order. Mm -hmm. And then as you finished it, one of the directors would come over and grade you. And then you mm -hmm. do the next thing to hair and then they would come and grade you. I don't know how it's done now, but it's probably done similar. And because when I stopped and looked around the room and saw that I was quite a bit ahead of everyone, I was certain that I'd missed something. So I went to the bathroom and I stayed for quite a while going over it in my head thinking, well, if you're going to fail, you're going to fail. Cause I don't know what I've done wrong. And I went back and I finished. Well, I didn't do anything wrong. It's just that I had done so much work. I had already, uh -huh. worked. my speed was there. But the important part is that the textbook part became easy because I had already worked it all out in real life and then it made sense and I could picture it. I could mm -hmm. see it. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really want to be a cosmetologist. <laughs> I didn't, that was, you know, my dad saying I had to go to school. So I really never did anything with that. But even just knowing that I could go yeah. to school and do well and how that worked for me um, was encouraging to me. Now I'd like to take you back way back <clears throat> when you first started talking about how you felt as a first grader mm -hmm. uh, because one of the things that you know i i am really happy to be able to homeschool my kids and if you've listened to my podcast you've heard me talk about i have the two children that you just described i have the child the first child uh who 
memory like a trap. You know, the kid can memorize anything. Everything is easy. Um, minimal amount of effort to accomplish anything really, um, whether academic or not. And then I have my second child who can't spell. Uh, we're about to go in sixth grade and I'm still, I as a mother am mortified by her spelling, (laughs) but we're working on it. And, you know, I have the the luxury of of not having the, the pressure of right. having having her to have to take tests whenever she takes her standardized tests. You know, I know she's going to bomb the spelling and, and okay. But, you know, I have, I have a curricula that I've implemented with the first child that will get halfway through it with the second child and she can't remember what we did last week. And we have to go back over it. And so now I've learned that we have to, she has to do, it's, 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 you're like totally describing her. If she does something, if I have her act it out or do something, then she's got it. But she has to have that, uh, that kinetic aspect to stuff. Rote memorization, mm-mm, not doing it. And so I'm, I've really started to evaluate whether those math facts that I've been obsessed over for, um, you know, she's, she's 11 now, but I've been obsessing over those math facts for years. Yeah. I've now gotten to a point where I'm questioning, you know, with this child, you know, if, if I have to do anything now, I use a calculator. I don't have to do math in my head. So is it even right. something that I need to even press at this point? And I've kind of decided that, no, I don't. We're just going to move on. But I love the way you talk about that. And I know that my older child will kind of make little snarky comments mm-hmm. about how long it takes her to memorize things or how long it takes her to pick up on things. And I can't even you know, I shut him down pretty quickly, but I can't imagine what it would be like if you were a child in a school, right? Getting those messages from all the adults and probably from some of the children. So I'd love for you to talk more about as a child who's been there, how it can really affect your psyche, how it can really affect how you feel about yourself and how you think that plays into your future success, how it can play into your future, future success or not being successful by being bombarded by all of that. Yes. And you touched on the beginning a little bit on personality because the personality types, I am more of an extroverted. So I think it was going to be even harder for an introverted mm-hmm. child going to it. I'm naturally a more glasses half full. I mean, maybe more even when I talked about middle school and younger grades, just like a risk taker, you know, cause I was skipping class. Well, where some, where some aren't, but, um, so the whole thing about homeschooling, which is crazy is that when, so, you know, let's say I was seven, eight years old in my room playing house and I had my little stuffed animals out. And when I played house, my dream was that I would never send my kids to school, mm-hmm. that I would school them at home. And I would teach them, I'd have a chalkboard and I'd teach them their ABCs. Of course, I'd never heard of homeschooling, didn't know it existed. But as a little girl, still in early elementary, that was my dream, that they would never have to go to school. I had a very mean teacher in second grade who would even hit me. And what happened is, and I know teachers don't do that now, but actually we say that, but then sometimes we hear about (laughs) the things that go on and we're like, wait a minute. But she, she would just be like, think, think, think. And she would walk up and down the hallways, I mean, the, the aisles. But then I was so scared of her. Any work that I would have been able to do, I could no longer do. I was frightened of her. She was very unkind to me and another child in the class um, who was more hyper. Mm-hmm. And I was just behind and not getting it. Um, and so my mom said that I had started, started having nightmares and walking in my sleep, oh. et cetera just because of the stress that I was under. And that was second grade. And were you even able to articulate that to your parents when you got home? No, because of the shame. So what happened is, and my mom tells a story how angry she was, is I wasn't finishing anything 
because again, I'm hunkered down while almost looking up to see if the teacher is going to come by. And sometimes she would take her pencil and just whap you, just she had it perfected, just whap you hard on the head. <laughs> but even if she wasn't going to hit you or you were wondering if she was going to, or she would actually take and make me an example. So yes, that was a horrible teacher. They weren't all as bad as her, but this started in second grade to take my paper and make it an example of what not to do. But I started putting all this unfinished work in my desk and the communication from her and my parents was pretty much zero. And then when I got incomplete, you know, for, uh, on my report card, and then my mom went to the school and um, it was just all really humiliating and really embarrassing that I had all these unfinished worksheets. And my mom tells me that she went to the principal to say, move my daughter to another class. And they said, well, I'm sorry, we can't, we don't have room. And so that was the end of it. Um, so with different teachers, it was different on how they handled the kids that were behind or struggling. So then there were the ones that just gave you a pass. Mm -hmm. And eventually you just get a pass, even though every year we're supposed to be a better teacher and a, and a better situation. Um, How do you think that, that was the same in high school? Just, they just pass you. But, um, but I think that affected you kind of emotionally and how you felt about yourself. Oh, it's something that I have struggled with even in the past few years. Mm -hmm. So fast, so always feeling like you have to hide it. Um, you know, just apply yourself, just do your work. I still hear of these type things and it makes me, you know, anxious, um, you know, set up a place, you know, even if you're a homeschooler for your child and make them sit there at their desk and you can't get up until you have it done. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work, especially if there's some ADD, there's usually some other things going on there too. <clears throat> so I was ashamed all the way. I mean, getting out of school, I was still ashamed. I was ashamed and put shame on myself that others didn't see. I've had so many people ask me, you know, over the years, what is your degree in? What is your, you know, you talk about so many things. We're trying to figure out what your degree is in. And it's really a hard hurdle for me to get over. My, mm -hmm. my adult friend said, you know, nobody thinks of you that way. It's you. You need to lose the label. You need to lose it. And a few years ago, decided whether I was going to get a degree or not. And I really pondered it prayed about it and decided that, no, I wasn't going to go back because I'm mm -hmm. very self-taught. Mm -hmm. And that is what I discovered as a young woman. I felt like I was uh, still fighting the system, mm -hmm. even though I had success after success mm -hmm. inwardly, I felt like I was still fighting the system. Mm -hmm. When I was young, I was full of shame. And it caused great friction between me and my, most of my teachers, not all of them, and between my parents mm -hmm. and between my brother and I, because that's, that's the golden prize. The golden prize is to do good in school. Right. And nobody ever talked to me about my other talents and abilities, really. Right. Because in, in, oftentimes in school, your other talents and abilities don't matter. And that's one of the reasons why I love homeschooling. And that's what I'm doing with my child. Um, she has a great gift in art. She has, there are so many things that she loves to do. She's in musical theater. So my thing with her is that we're going to put as many resources and time into those things that she's really great at. Because I think at the end of the day, that's where she's going to be drawn to anyway. And so let's help her to be the best she can be in those things in which she thrives. Tell me about how you so despite all this icky in school, you've had great success. So I'd love to hear about your success and let parents hear how it doesn't all end with school. Right. So anyone and everyone pays better attention to something they're interested in. Okay. Yes. I, I'm just not a textbook. Why am I not going? Why didn't I go ahead and go to school and get a degree and prove to everybody that I could get a degree? It's because I'm not a textbook person. I'm not a read the chapter take the quiz, take the final. That's not who I am. But what I did learn is I can copy and watch mm -hmm. and figure out what people do and adjust that to what works for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm very adaptable, which when you're in a classroom and you have to do exactly like a teacher says, who even notices that you're adaptable? Mm -hmm. All you know is if they give you something to do, you can't do it. And that is where in homeschooling, we can give our 
children lots of opportunities to figure out how they do learn best. So what happened is I would watch people who were the best wherever I was working or whatever I was working on. And then I would copy what they would do. Or even when I found myself in jobs that I wasn't maybe completely qualified or trained for, but they didn't realize that. I remember the first time my boss said, type a memo. I'm like, type a memo. Okay. And so I got out uh, another memo and I thought, okay, here's how it's laid out. Here's the format. Mm -hmm. And I have copied a lot. And that's what I tell my kids now. And I learned as a homeschool mom, you know, when someone is great at art, they have apprentices underneath them because you need to learn. Copying right. is a huge part of how we learn. That's what apprenticeship is. Um, that's the standard is set, except in school, you have all these things that tend to not have purpose. <laughs> yes. Where in real life, when your boss says, you know, could you send out a memo on that? You figure out really fast how to do a memo and, and it doesn't make any difference. And it does start making you feel good because you're thinking, wow, I'm doing all these things mm -hmm. and I didn't get the college degree. So I moved uh, to Atlanta and uh, worked in an office where everyone in the office had a degree except myself. And I was one of the top persons in the office. Mm -hmm. I did very well. I got raises, bonuses, I got moved up the ladder, but I still held on to that, not wanting people to know that I didn't have a degree. Yeah. Because it the, the shame was still there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's changing and maybe even more so in the homeschool community because um, we're already out of the box. We're yes. already going against the grain. And what I'm looking at or what I think I'm seeing is that we have an entrepreneurship track Yep, where kids and families are starting that in the homeschool movement even before the kids are even in high school. Yep, and then there's the trade school track. What what trade do you want to go? You can take off during the school hours. Yes, and go work at something and investigate and see if that's something you're interested in. See what your talents are, and then there is the college track, which is great. I have nothing against it, but I would love to see those those three options. Um, for students. So I was almost embarrassed to say what I wanted to do, but I wanted to travel. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, then I should be a travel agent. And I investigated it on my own, but I thought everybody was going to make fun of me. Like, oh, sure. Who doesn't want to travel and who doesn't want to be a travel agent? But that's what I did. I actually um, went to school. It was just a six month school. Mm -hmm. And to be a travel agent. And then I investigated that corporate travel was where the money was. And I was looking for the money. Mm -hmm. And a specific type of corporate travel was where you would actually go into the company. Like one of the probably most famous companies I worked for was Amico Fabrics and Fibers Division right here in Atlanta, mm -hmm. where they did so much travel. I had an office within their building. Oh, wow. And that's how you made the most money is in corporate travel was you would work at a satellite location. And, um, so I moved to Atlanta and that is what I did. I did it and I loved it. And I did get all my travel perks and all my Delta perks at the Braves games and everything. And um, it was really exciting, but I, it was hands-on. It really was hands-on and working really hard. When I needed to learn to do something new, mm -hmm. I would actually, it was kind of a con, a little bit of a lie. <laughs> Because people would be getting ready to go home at the end of the day. And they say, hey, you done? Are you finishing it up? You need help? And I say, oh, I'm going to be done. Oh, in five minutes, I'll be out of here. And then everybody would leave. And I might sit there for another hour, mm -hmm. hour and a half, learning more on the system, learning more mm -hmm. of what I needed to do without anybody knowing. And of course, I wasn't going to charge my time or anything like that because I needed the training. And that's one of the things that I've learned you know, with dyslexia it can take us longer to learn something mm -hmm. with whatever learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. But then once you get it, yep. you get it. And yep. since I was literally having to work on things, it was again, flipping the scenario yes. and it gave it purpose. And so many kids, they tell us that we have to find the motivation for our high schoolers or our motivation for our middle schoolers. Mm -hmm. And they're going, there is no motivation to do this math or there mm -hmm. is no motivation to learn about world war one. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I've actually just started a, a new program where I work with parents to help them kind of identify their kids' interests and right. where they might want to go in for college or for a career. When I say career, I mean non-college track. Um, 
And then we plan strategically on how to get the child there. So um, you don't, I, I did a, an interview with uh, Pam Andrews here and her son was in, interested in art, similar to my daughter. They knew it. He had his own little uh, summer program in art. Instead of taking physics at high school, he took physics for artists, artists, um, oh, that's nice. From one of the classes on edX.org or Coursera. And so she found things that were specifically suited to what he wanted to do. And the schools don't do that because now they have is the, the same old, all the schools have the same classes that everyone else is taking. And yeah, you know, everybody's kind of on the same track. But if you can figure out what your child's interests are you can build their learning around their interests it will help them to be more successful as you said whether you have a learning disability or not it will help them to be more successful and help them be more engaged and that's one of the big things we complain about kids these days is that they're not engaged well that's because it's boring it's boring <laughs> it is boring and so one of the things that um i you know, I did start learning differently. I copied. I remember one time, this was you know, in a young adult working here in Atlanta, listening to someone on a talk show talk about the way they did every day math. So I'm stuck in traffic and I'm listening to this man and it all made sense to me. And I literally started doing math different mm -hmm. after I heard this man. I didn't, I thought maybe I'll buy his book. I never even bought his book. All I had to do was just listen to like this 40 minute radio program mm -hmm. and it made sense to me. Um, and other things started coming together. I told my son for years now, it gets easier as you get older. Get, and of course it does because our, our brain is developing and we have, and maybe it got easier when we got older because we, I had more hands on. I was mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. element, not mm -hmm. stuck with a textbook mm -hmm. or um, classroom restrictions. But he is going to be 25 soon. And he came in about a month ago. He, he doesn't live here, but he came by the house and he goes, oh yeah, mom, by the way, you're right. It is getting easier. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, that may not be what you want to hear as a homeschool parent, if you're feeling the pressure mm -hmm. of the culture, even in the homeschool culture. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, isn't there a lot of hope for that? I am so glad. In fact, when I was telling them, it gets easier when you get older there was maybe a little part of me going, I hope so. I, hope I'm right. <laughs> I didn't tell him that, but you know, to have him come home and say, you're right, mom, it's easier. I'm like, yes, yes. Because we, we need that hope. And mom needs to know that they don't have mm -hmm. to have everything by 18, 19. Yes. yes. It gets easier. It, it definitely gets easier for, for everybody. So two things I want to say that you have, highlighted one of the things that I talk about all the time, which is you taught yourself how to learn. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think that is the most important thing that we can teach our children how to learn. If right. they know how to learn in a way that works for them, because for example, I'm a visual person. And so you can sit here and prattle at me all day. I mean, you talk about a degree. I, I went to law school. I have a law degree. But if you sat here and talked to me all day, I wouldn't remember a thing you said. It's just like when we scheduled this the first time. I didn't write it down. And so it never went inside of my brain. I didn't write it down right away. And uh, we've actually had to reschedule this because um, we talked about it verbally. <laughs> I didn't have anything to write with. And if I even if I had written it down and had seen it written, I would have you, remembered. And you would have remembered. Yeah. yeah, but I am, I'm a visual learner. I do not, I can't remember anything if I just hear it. And so in school, I'd go to class whenever I would go to class when I was in college. <laughs> I wouldn't even take notes because it didn't matter. I would have to always read the textbook. I have to have a book. My son okay. is audio. And so he gets so frustrated with me when he's trying to read something to me and explain something to me. And I'm like, let me see it. I need to read I it. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to see it. It doesn't, but mom, I just told you, I was like, it doesn't matter. I've got to read it. And so he's audio, but my daughter has to have audio. She has to have visual and she has to touch with her. I have to engage all of the senses, but they each know, we talk about it all the time, what their learning styles are and how best they learn. 
And so now when I have to learn something, I mean, I know I have to read it with my son in order to, he's working on Spanish. I tell him 50,000 times he has to repeat it to himself. Right. Yes. Because he learns best by hearing it. And so if he doesn't say it out loud to himself, he won't remember. And with my daughter, we've got, well, for both of them, we have an online tutor, but I have had to like, we've got Rosetta Stone. So we're paying for the online tutor and also Rosetta Stone. And also I'm printing off worksheets for her because if we don't do all of those for her, then it's gone. Yeah. But, but she also knows to take notes. So she knows immediately if you start prattling stuff off for her, she's going to go get her pen. She's going to say, wait a second. It sounds like something I have to remember. And people will look at her. Adults will look at her. And I'll just say, you know, she's, she has to take notes. Well, she's self-aware with that. And, and, <laughs> and don't step on any toes here, Jen, but a lot of times girls are more self-aware than boys. <laughs> so they need that. They need, in fact, I, with my son, I talked about getting, I know it's dorky, but hey, a little notebook mm -hmm. on a string and put it around his <laughs> neck with a pen yeah. so he could write them. But, you yeah. know, but then when he did get a job, he does have to write, write yes. it down. Very resistant. Some kids are very, like you said, you know, you tell your, you told your son a thousand times, yes. say it out loud. Oh my word, kids can be so resistant to what they mean. <laughs> but the funny thing is they're hearing you. They may not be obeying you now, but when it counts and they need to learn it later, they're going to hear your voice going, say it out loud. <laughs> but I'm going to segue in this board I have here. I did not know it's, I need a new board. The weather is, um, so multi-sensory. So kids, mm -hmm. any, any children with learning disabilities, anybody can learn at the same program, but that's what we're talking about for language. We're talking about a multi-sensory. So you're touching um, you're hearing, you're saying, you, the dictation, mm -hmm. and then it's the way it's sequenced. Mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you some of, well, I'm thankful that when homeschooling started, there were some private schools that would started selling to homeschoolers. Mm -hmm. But when I look at some spelling lists and some spelling programs, maybe just your average spelling program, you, know, you have four different spelling phonics rules in one yes. spelling test in second grade. Yes. That is way more than a dyslexic child can handle. So, um, and I won't demonstrate it now, but we have the board so you can have the touch aspect. And there's- Is this something you offer? Is this something this you recommend? Is, this is Wilson Language Program. Okay, yeah, you had mentioned that. And there are tutors all around the Atlanta area. So what I did was we would, and then you have the workbooks. We would go to the tutor, but I was learning how to do it. I bought all the, here you go, self-taught again. All right. And so let me just, this is going to be probably hard to imagine, but so I've learned now I, that daydream of homeschooling my children is reality. Mm -hmm. Now I have kids and I'm going to say to my family who I know is going to think I'm crazy and they did. I thought impossible that I'm going to homeschool in my mind. I thought, what are you thinking and how bad are you going to mess up your kids? Mm -hmm. But then the other side remembered all of the pain mm -hmm. and I swore, you know, I made this vow at whatever age I will never make my children have to go through in school what I went through in school. So I started the homeschooling and now I am hungry to learn how to do it right. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading so much. So just, and that's how we came really about to understanding my sons and just more into what my problems were. But consistency is so important to the young learners in the math and language arts. You have so much room for other things that you can do. And I say elementary should be a sweet, sweet, fun, fun time. Yes. You yes. should be having a lot of fun. Yep. I but agree. I have a very, um, I have a strong opinion about the reading. And I know this flies in the face of, especially, you know, the unschooling movement, which is really big, but I believe that learning how to read and write gives children a chance to feel grown up. Kids want to be grown up. Babies mm -hmm. want to hold a phone. They want to do what grown ups do. They want to read their own menu. They want to read the billboards. They want to be able to play a game with other kids and be able to read the cards. Mm -hmm. So where the temptation might be to say, 
some are saying that you will naturally, they'll eventually learn. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with that. I think reading is such a huge gift and the yeah. sooner that they can be reading. So I, you know, in elementary years, there's a lot of room. There's many different ways to homeschool. You can be very relaxed, but I encourage parents make it so your children can read and write mm -hmm. because it gives an independence like nothing else. I mean, as my daughter and I were talking the other day, she says, look at the slaves that you had to hide to read mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. you know, and over time, you know, that is the way you oppress a people mm -hmm. is you make it so that they can't read because mm -hmm. then you can't learn for yourself. Right. So I am very firm on, you know, being consistent mm -hmm. in, in the language arts for your students. And if you have to get a program, if you have to set other things aside in your day because you have five kids and you're homeschooling mm -hmm. or because other things are going on, start your day with the discipline study. Start your day with this because it's going to take time. Yeah. And you have to learn. You don't want to move so slow. It discourages the child. You have mm -hmm. to keep moving because it'll revisit. And then, you know, for my son, one day it just all kind of clicked. But when I started learning this program, and I had all the teacher's manuals and I'm studying it and I'm practicing mm -hmm. before I ever started with him. All I could think was, what would my life have been like if someone helped me? What, what would have, the, the thing is now is it, and I know this is very cliche, but, oh, but now look at my message. Look at my passion. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am like angry and I hear it because I have friends that are teaching in the school system that tell me, oh yeah, well, um, I'm in a remediation program for fifth graders that can't read. Wow. Oh, we, we got to hurry up and get a reading before they get in sixth grade. Or even I met a woman one time and she told me, well, I'm quitting that job and now I'm going to be teaching sixth and seventh graders how to read. And I said, sixth and seventh grade, they don't care anymore. And she looked at me and she said, you're right. They don't care one bit. Why do I know? Because I was there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, so again, fly in the face of some, of some homeschool communities, but I believe to give the kids the independence, to start them reading, and they need it for so many other subjects. I believe in living books in excellent literature. Yep. I mean, I'm talking like um, Where the Red Fern Grows, or the first mm -hmm. chapter books, the Magic Treehouse books, mm -hmm. you know, books mm -hmm. that my kids love to read, that they learn from they learned so much from the amount of books we had. And I think because I read to them constantly and I even had my son with dyslexia next to me, reading to me, not making him sound out, whatever he could read, I would read. And then I would fill in the word. Uh -huh, uh -huh. We need, I still need this. I'm not kidding. We need to hear the words a lot uh -huh. we need to hear them. We need to see them. So I mm -hmm. have to read to my child with dyslexia. Mm -hmm. When there's a new word in culture and I need to learn it, I go to mm -hmm. dictionary.com mm -hmm. and I click on the, the way it's, and then I sit here at my desk, literally, there was a new word. Oh, and have it, have them pronounce day. it. Mm -hmm. I was reading an article just this week and I saw a word. I thought, I don't know that word. Mm -hmm. So I go to dictionary.com and I might do that four or five times. If I don't use it, I'm going to lose it. Mm -hmm. I still struggle with multi long, multi-syllable words. I can hear long words in my head properly. So if I'm reading, I hear it properly in my head and I recognize it mm -hmm. because it's a familiar word to me. But if I were to read it out loud, I might stumble on the pronunciation. Sure. And my husband's been correcting me. Oh, we've been married 28 years. He's been, <laughs> <laughs> he's been correcting me on my pronunciation for that long. He gave up on the spelling a long time ago. <laughs> But when I was doing the Wilson language program, and I want to tell everybody about a company in the Atlanta area, but they also do tell it, you know, they'll do it via computer. Mm -hmm. It's called syllables. I've not used it. I was told that they actually um, have a really good program like Wilson, maybe a little easier okay. than Wilson language program. Syllables Learning Center. Yes. Syllables Learning Center. But here's probably the, the most important thing. When your child is in school, a traditional school environment, you need to get the kind of testing that they say by the people they say, yep. and it might take a year. Yep. If you're homeschooling, syllables has an evaluation that they will do. It's 
$125 at this time. So this is 2020 mm -hmm. and it's $125, which is way less. And they said, because they don't have, you're not talking about having to develop an IEP and all right. that stuff. And just for the people that know in homeschooling, no, you do not have to have an IEP, but they work with the students a couple times a week. But I'm very proactive that the mom understands the program. But when I was doing this program with my son and my eyes were being opened and I was learning things for the first time, I absolutely loved it. So you wonder how, um, a person with dyslexia teaches another person with dyslexia. Mm -hmm. Well, because I had learned because mm -hmm. I was 35 when mm -hmm. I started um, homeschooling my five-year-old, mm -hmm. my oldest. Um, and it was actually three years later before we discovered this, but I loved it. I learned more. I spelled better than ever. I still spell better today because of this program, mm -hmm. because Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't already discovered it, um, the computer does not help you with everything. There oh my are gosh. words that mm -hmm. I'd be like, I have no idea how to begin. So, yeah, you have to be able to get it partially there in order for it to pick it up. And yes. if you're like my daughter, she spells very phonetically. Mm -hmm. So anything with a k sound is spelled with a K. Yeah. Even though we, we use all about spelling and that's helped her a tremendous amount because like you said, I've, I've tried numerous um, spelling programs. The list don't work. Um, no other spelling program has Memorization worked. does not work. It does not work. Um, and so with All About Spelling, which sounds similar to Wilson, although I know, I think Wilson is a, probably a much larger, more comprehensive program, but right. the All About Spelling is based on the Orton-Gillingham Method, well, and so all of these are just about are, all of okay. them are. So what they did is they took the Orton Gilligan and then different people. Ha and I think I just pronounced that wrong, but see, I kind of mumbled. It so <laughs> notice that's okay. <laughs> names. Okay. For a dyslexic names are one of the biggest nightmares just for everybody out there. Just wondering about that person. If you know someone who never gets names, right. <laughs> they probably have dyslexia because names are the bane of our existence. But, um, <laughs> so all of that was kind of, that was the beginning learning. And then what somebody does is they go in, they think, well, I think this is the best way to teach that. I think this is the best way to teach it. So Syllables Learning Center teaches it a little bit different than Wilson, who teaches mm -hmm. a little bit different than all, all of the mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. um, the main thing is accessibility, affordability, right. and consistency within the program. Now, just another thing that you, your listeners might want to know. So my dot, I, I think God is you know, God is great. I always say if I would have just kept having kids, I would probably would have had <laughs> learned more and more and more. But, but my daughter, I remember thinking nobody could ever learn this natural way. This is ridiculous. I think that kids are just going to learn to read. My second child, my son was very typical, right down the line mm -hmm. for a boy on the way he progressed to read and what age he started reading chapter books. And then he just took off. So my oldest took all this time, a special program. It was more like seventh grade before he's so spelling started to kick in and mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. But my daughter taught herself <laughs> that at four years old, the ubiquitous child who taught herself to read, who seems like in some communities, everybody's kid taught them to read. And my son didn't decide he was going to start reading until he was in sixth grade. And now oh, he, I can't now make him reads. stop, reading, stop but reading, but we worked on it every day. But you <laughs> we, worked on it. Yeah. So every see. day. We did never not work well, so, on it. <laughs> but did he, but did he know well enough to read to do those things that I said? Did he know how to read well enough to play a game? With oh yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't have a, um, he, yeah. what we discovered at some point is he had a visual issue, oh, okay. uh, 2020, but he had, a uh, convergence insufficiency. So his eyes were, you know, he was seeing double kind of right oh, where you put the my brother had that problem. And yeah. so we, once we got that uh, taken care of, it had gone so long before we could figure it out that he had kind of turned off. And again, he doesn't even have the pressure that you would have in school, but even still he became frustrated. And I'll admit I was frustrated too um, because he knew his phonetic rules. He just it was a visual thing was that, visual. Was, no, my that wasn't picked up, that. you know, yeah. it wasn't picked up in a regular vision exam. I had to take him to a vision therapist. So it took him a while to kind of get over being angry and being frustrated. But then um, I always let him read books that he enjoyed. I mean, he couldn't read the, you know, Captain Underpants or anything like that. But like you said, it had to be uh, something that I approved. Right. He could choose it. 
<laughs> and as long as I approved of it, it wasn't, you know, disrespectful. To hey, parents. we had library guidelines. We had yeah. library guidelines and the kids knew what I was going to approve. Yes. Or not. And you're right. We didn't, and I know, no, not offending anybody, but no, at our house, we didn't read can captain and her pants either. Yeah. But, um, uh, and you know, so the moms might be feeling overwhelmed hearing you talk about, Oh, my son had this visual problem and I'm going, Oh yeah, the special, you know, just parents take one, one day at a time. Mm -hmm. You're not under the pressure that they have to pass tests. And that's the key. Yeah. And move as your child needs to, and do not beat yourself up for not figuring things out right away. Um, letting some things go. So the more, more important things can get done. Yep. Um, you know, that's just really important. So sh look for those, that giftedness. Where are they yes. gifted? Look for areas yes. for them to succeed. That was probably the best advice that we'd had. And music. So there has been a new study out and I don't have the, the article right in front of me right now, but they, you can pick up sounds. Once kids start learning music, it makes it easier to pick up sounds. So they say that mm -hmm. music lessons can be just as beneficial for the average kid mm -hmm. and that, that maybe you might think needs extra tutoring and reading, but if you got them music instead, mm -hmm. then that would be all they would need because mm -hmm. they start learning to, to hear new tones, mm -hmm. but find an area for your struggling student to succeed. Yes. And when you talk about learning styles, find some things that they can do that they can succeed with and be proud of. And I can only imagine that you can figure out all the different ways your daughter could do art. My, my son had a very unique way of doing art, very detailed, teeny tiny detailed work mm -hmm. that would just blow my head. Gary and I was like blown away. Like he'd do a ocean an under the ocean scene with brain coral and do all of the lines. We're like, who does that? Who has the patience to sit there and do that? But you know, we have to, in homeschooling, we're so fortunate we can expose our kids to so many things. Yes. My, my daughter learns by, by modeling. So she finds all these free tutorials. And once she sees, she'll watch a part of it, she'll pause it, and then she can freehand it and it will look exactly like the picture. But, um, if she, she finds people who are showing you how to do it. And so right. once you show her how to do it, she sees it, she can, she can reproduce it. And it's, it's really amazing. Um, it's just. Whereas in a classroom, I guess, you know, how does that translate into math? Well, you know, the joke that the math samples, the samples were always the easy problems and then you turn the page. <laughs> oh gosh. And they were completely different. <laughs> Or yes. it's still that have, way, <laughs> you know, this much of the class gets it already. Just move on teacher. You know, the yes. teachers are, are, you know, what are they going to do? The, the kid who needs that was my son again versus the ones who are like, please already. And at our house, my oldest had the disabilities, but my second did not. And my second had a memory. Oh yeah. In when they were six and four and I wasn't even schooling him at four which those of you at home school, it, there is a trickle down effect. You don't have to, the younger right. ones pick up a ton, but he would be in two rooms over and answer the question and he would hear me and I'd be, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was a struggle yeah. for a few years to say, you may not answer for <laughs> yeah. your brother. <laughs> That's funny. Well, Jennifer, give us kind of, um, you've homeschooled your three, they're, they're all adults. Mm -hmm. And so despite your, your struggles and despite the fact that you still have, um, remnants of the struggle you've been successful and so if you can just tell us how you know for moms out there who have learning disabilities who themselves may AD, may be ADD or may have dyslexia what kind of encouragement can you give them about because the the big uh, in my in my homeschool group just about everybody that has I have questions uh, that people have to fill out to to get into the group and just about everybody says they're afraid they're going to mess their kids up and so I like to have people, uh, before my, my guests finish, I'd, I'd love to have them speak to the mom. And in your case, the mom who has a learning disability, who's afraid she's going to mess their kids up. What, what can you say to her to give her encouragement? 13 years of school is not their life. The things that we have to do as moms is we have to say, hmm. 
is my child intelligent? Yes. Can they learn either, like we said, auditory textbooks? Are they college bound? You need to know yourself, mom, but you need to know your kids and don't listen to the lies because honestly, a child who is not motivated will become motivated in the real world when they want to do what they want to do. Just mm -hmm. like I wanted to travel. And at the time, it's non-existent now, but at the time, it was a very fun, lucrative business to get involved in. And I learned it. Um, I would say you're just, you're not, how are you going to mess up your child if you're working on a steady process? Put a system in place for yourself. The main things are going to be math and language arts. You're not, C's get degrees. C's <laughs> yes. get degrees. I love that. Some kids, their job <laughs> needs a degree. I have one who could get A's. He has measured it out even in college. And he said, I can cut my hours at work and spend more time studying to get A's mm -hmm. or I can work more so I can have more money to play because he's mm -hmm. paying his own way and then get a C and still get my degree. <laughs> oh my word. Right. But when we have had some really hard years in homeschooling, cause I had some health issues and my kids had to go to public school and even my child. And, and yes, with your child and learning disabilities goes to public school, they come home and you do homework till 10 o'clock at night every uh. night. So many people started homeschooling cause they said, Oh, we're, you know, we're working till 10 at night. But, um, but I'm looking and I'm recognizing and I'm seeing where he excels. Every person he's ever worked for goes on and on about how a wonderful person he is, how mm -hmm. wonderful leader he is, how he does so well at things. Um, he had his Eagle Scout and mm -hmm. his Eagle Scout project was very difficult, mm -hmm. but he, he keeps moving and he's been successful and you're not going to ruin your child unless you're abusing them and you're not yeah. abusing them what you're talking mm -hmm. about is maybe not in your mind perfectly teaching them chemistry mm -hmm. or perfectly teaching them this it's not over we don't peak at 18 how about that my friend michelle <laughs> i put it in my book at one of my chapters we don't peak at high school yeah. we don't but our world is we taught our kids how to ha hack the test yep you start talking in middle school, you're going to have to take these ACT or the SAT and you're going to hack the test. And they even have changed it now to where, you know, you can take portions of the test. You can retake the test and retake the test. Mm -hmm. It's all about passing the test. And then when you go to college, it's all about passing the test. So you're going to hack the system for those kids that can, right? Mm -hmm. So I have this excellent, very long article I read not long ago. And the guy, he's a, he funds startups. And he says, these kids come in here that are so used to hacking the system yes. and now they want to hack this. He's yes. like, there is no hacking it. So you just have to produce a good product. Yeah. But give us the formula. Yes. Tell me how to hack this. And he's like, yep. well, no, you actually now have to work. <laughs> so no, you're not going to ruin your kids because they don't peak in high school. You're going to expose them to multiple kinds of learning. You're mm -hmm. going to feel like you failed miserably at times in certain subjects. You're going to hire tutors. Yep. You can do it. Don't worry. Stop worrying about things in elementary. <laughs> Just stop worrying. You're going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. You may sometimes go, dang, I spent a lot of money on homeschooling. Well, you're giving your child a private education. My husband mm -hmm. and I, I, we've paid for tutors. Mm -hmm. We've done different things. Mm -hmm. We're like, okay, no regrets. So we haven't yeah. driven the nicest cars and live in the big fancy house because mm -hmm. we had to budget the way we budgeted. No regrets. Mm -hmm. We would do it all again. And that's the so, thing. Like you, you mentioned the tutors. I tell people that all the time. You know, I, my, my son's moving into algebra one. I could teach it, but why would I? I'm so putting him in a co-op and paying $300 for the semester so somebody else can teach him. I mean, why right, would I do it? <laughs> you want someone that can, so Isaac one year had to mow the lawn um, for his uh, geometry tutor, mm -hmm. which he said was one of the best tutors he ever had. He was a professor at KSU, mm -hmm. statistics at KSU. He loved Isaac mowing his lawn. You know how wonderful that was for me? I mean, oh, yeah. and for him too. And, for your son. <laughs> and get that man. Yes. Way better than me to do it. I know another woman, she's just brilliant uh, with all the sciences. She teaches the sciences. She goes, yeah. bring them on, bring them on. And so she's got all these homeschool boys trimming bushes and mowing lawns <laughs> and doing whatever. Yeah. And you know, it wasn't 
you know, to her, it was very valuable and to the homeschool parent it was valuable. So mom, if you mm -hmm. can teach science or grade um, essays and compositions or whatever, it, you know, you just don't know what it's going to turn out like in high school. Don't freak out about high school. Somehow we get there, yep. we make it, we get the resources we need. And if a class bombs or you don't think your kid did very well, it's not the end of the world. <laughs> and if they are going to go to college and they want to hack the test, bye. Let them do it. Let them practice those SATs. Let them practice the ACT. I did not have my son take any of them because I knew what would happen. All the talk was everybody was talking about it and comparing their scores. I thought it would discourage him. I thought he wouldn't need it because he was going to go to junior college. And all you have to do is go there and take a placement test. Mm -hmm. It's so easy. You walk in the door and they have two placement tests for you to take. You take them, you know, right away if you pass or not. Mm -hmm. If you don't pass, least this was even um just last year for my daughter mm -hmm. you have um like you can go back in 24 hours and retake it oh that was on it that part <laughs> that's why we have that test by not taking it and by by and that's another way maybe is dyslexic you could say or struggling students can hack it is by starting at a smaller right junior college or or, or or a trade and you know trade. Uh, my mm -hmm. stepson um he does a trade he does hvac repair yeah. And, you know, that's, and so he does uh, the larger ones, not like residential, but he's, mm -hmm. he's doing an apprenticeship in um, HVAC repair and he's doing really well. And I, I can see him, he's going to do really well. And, and so that's the other thing, you know, I think as homeschoolers, we can be open to entrepreneurship. We can be open, more open to trades and more open to just a variety of things out there because, um, everybody's different and we can, we can, we can identify that and help our kids identify that. And so you're, and right you're struggling student. Um, you really helped that we had him doing a lot of things at home in the neighborhood jobs, a lot of scouting things. So he was skilled in multiple areas. So that's mm -hmm. why anytime anybody would hire him for anything, they thought he was fabulous. Um, and when he did get his first, full-time regular job they he came home and he said mom everyone thinks i am so smart mm -hmm. he goes because i don't think they've ever read a book <laughs> <laughs> that, that this has been great uh jennifer so i hope that this has been really helpful to all you moms who are out there who are struggling with uh learning disabilities yourself or whose children are. I hope this has been really inspiring for you. Uh, Jennifer is going to come back and talk to us about project-based learning uh, to help develop executive functioning. So make sure you stay tuned for her. Um, I have put it in my calendar, so we definitely will be <laughs> filming that episode and uh, probably be available in about a month. So uh, look out for that. And uh, it's Thank you so much, Jennifer, for being with us and, oh, and, share, and sharing, really, um, despite the embarrassment and the shame that you said you felt all those years. I really appreciate you, but your you know, transparency and being vulnerable and sharing that with us because I know a lot of people really need to hear it. Awesome. Thank you.